relationships, how we deal with our church relationship, how we deal with those situations and circumstances that we will see uh, through this. So Tim, if you could, uh, let's turn to Mark chapter 3 and starting at verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Edomea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God! And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known, and he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James. And he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. And they went into an house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation because they said, He hath an unclean spirit. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. God, that your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts. Lord, that if your word challenges us in an area, that we would not try to change your word, but we say, Lord, you change me. And Lord, we ask that you would change us, transform us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, in Mark chapter 3, we see good advice and bad advice being given in this portion of Scripture. 
In verses 1 through 3, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, which most of the Pharisees and the Sadducees watched him. Why? Because he's doing something that they, that they considered to be unlawful. That you should not heal anybody, that, you know, that there should not be any kind of work on the Sabbath at all. So for them, they, just, they looked at it as being wrong, but this man had a withered hand, and they were in the synagogue. And so when he does this, they look at him, and they get angered. They are, they are very angry with him. In verse 5, it says that Jesus looked round about on them, and he was angered. Jesus was angered with their attitude. Now, that obviously goes against a lot of people who say, well, Jesus never got angry. You know, it's a, it's a sin to be, become angry, which the Word of God does not teach. The Bible says to be angry and sin not, right? He was angered at their attitude. Why? Because they are putting their traditions, not the Word of God, but they are putting their traditions above the Word of God. They are putting what they want on top of that, saying, you know what, it is not okay for you to heal somebody on the Sabbath, on a Sunday, it's not okay for you if, in other portions of Scripture, it's not okay for you if your donkey or someone, you know, uh, your donkey falls into a ditch. You cannot help that donkey. It has to just sit there. That, that's according to them. The Bible does not teach that. He is angered by their attitude. He is grieved at the hardness of their heart. That they are so far gone that, their heart, that they're letting themselves dictate what God's Word says instead of letting the Word of God transform them. Uh, into what they would have him to be. The Bible says that the Pharisees took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. You think this is, you know, that they have good intentions when it says, the Bible says that they wanted to destroy him? The Pharisees were an influential party of the Jewish people, those who sat in public trials with the governors of the providence. These were the higher ups that were seen at this time, these Herodians, the Pharisees, that they were all t together sitting there trying to make sure that whatever they wanted went. It's kind of like how you see nowadays with modern day politicians, right? If the narrative does not fit their agenda, they don't want it to happen. They will, uh, you know, they'll badmouth, they'll sling mud at the other party, just sitting there trying to get what they want. And you always have to look at what they're saying because what they're saying is not, always, is not true. It's what they're saying that's not said. That's the part that you need to realize and understand. The same goes here in, you know, in the Word of God that what the Pharisees are, you know, at this time and the scribes are saying is not necessarily what they want. What they want is to destroy Jesus. That's what they want to do. That would be uh, you know, like what we see in modern politics is that the other person wants to destroy the other person. They want that narrative to go against that other person. There were others who thought Jesus had gone too far. You say, well, who else? Some of his family and some of his friends. You say, wait a second. No, 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 no. Well, you know, and we'll talk about this a little bit more on Wednesday night, you know, uh, because the uh, Catholic Church does not believe that Jesus had brothers and sisters. The Bible plainly says that he had other. Yeah, they're not. You know, they're half brothers. They're half, you know. But he does have family besides Mary. Because the Catholic Church uh, teaches that Mary is the perpetual virgin, that she has always been a virgin, that, that there was no other children besides Jesus, and that's why they have deified her. So that's a little bit of, uh, you know, what you're going to see on, you know, or hear about on Wednesday. But that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about this morning. His friends, his family, like I said, thought that he had gone too far. Why did they think this way? Well, Jesus drew multitudes of, of followers. He drew many, many you know, uh, of followers. And the funny thing is, is that Jesus oftentimes, when he gets a, a big crowd, wants to see their heart. So what does he do? He makes a truthful statement that for most of them is hard to understand. He does the opposite of what the modern church does. He actually comes out and makes a truthful statement, and a lot of people leave because they're like, this is a hard saying to understand. The modern church is like, oh, I'm so sorry that you know, I presented the gospel to you. Let me make something up that way you don't feel hurt. In verse 7, it says that he left the city and he went to the seashore. So he has this big crowd of people, but then he goes, you know what, I'm going to leave them, and I'm going to go to the seashore. Most people nowadays love the limelight. They like being in front of everybody. They're like, oh, look at how great. Everybody's, you know, it's all about me. Jesus leaves the limelight. He leaves, you know, the spotlight of the stage. And he says, you know what, I'm going to go over there by the seashore. 
It says that he withdrew himself. But you know what? As he withdrew himself, still many people came to him. So much so that he had to teach from a boat. Now, I know that there are some that will say, well, see, it's okay you know, when I, uh, when I you know, don't come during the entire summer because I'm trying to teach my children from a boat. Now, you're trying to teach them how to water ski in tube. That's a whole other story. I'm not against the fact of people taking a vacation for a week or two you know, or whatever just to go, but when, you, know, you don't see somebody until you know, all of a sudden when summer hits and then you don't see them again until fall. There's a problem. Because you know why? Because you're not growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay to recharge your batteries and say, you know what, I just need some time away to refocus. But it's a whole other thing when you're gone and you go back and it's almost like when you come back, everybody at the church, you know, you have to fill out a visitor card. But their multitudes came for two reasons. There's two main reasons why uh, these people followed Jesus that came out. Mark chapter uh, 3, verses 9 and, uh, 9 and 10 says this. It says, And he spoke to his disciples that, had a, that a small ship should wait on, uh, wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. That word throng literally means to afflict or suffer persecution. They or sorry, suffer tribulation. They want him to suffer. They want to try and get him. It says right here, it says, For he had many, insomuch that they pressed him or rushed upon him for to touch him, as many had plagues. And so what we see here is that they want to grab a hold of him and beat him. I mean, basically, they want to, they want to afflict him. They want to hurt him. And so they were pressing because they wanted to hurt him while others wanted to be healed. You're going to have that situation where people are going to want to hear you because of you are the truth that you speak. And you're going to have others that want to hurt you because you speak the truth. Reason number two is that he healed many, and it says, as many had plagues. Plus, uh, unclean spirits or devils, when they saw him, they fell down before him crying. These are the devils. Let's jump down to verse 21. Verse 21, it says this, And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold uh, on him, for they said, He is beside himself. So they went, they went into a mountain, and when, they, uh, and when they were into the mountain, there was a house, and it says they went into a house in uh, verse 19. It says, And then the multitude came to a house, uh, came to the house as well. So the, uh, the, the multitude follows Jesus to this house. And what does it say? It says, and when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. This was not a lay hold like, hey, I'm going to like give you a hug or anything else. This is, this is lay hold like I want to hurt you. This is not lay hands like I want to pray for you. This is lay hands on you that I want to you know, take you down kind of a thing. When it says friends, these are those that are close to him. These are not just acquaintances. These are the ones that are close to him. You know, like the old saying says that you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Some of you say, I wish I could choose my family. They, uh, the Bible says that they were, they were of him. These were not the apostles, but his relatives, his friends, his family. It says they heard of, it, it says they heard of his conduct, his preaching, his, anno- uh, his appointing the, of the apostles. So they, pro- they might have had problems with who he picked. They said, do you have these ones close to you? Do you not know who they are? And also his drawing such a multitude to his preaching. So there's all this stuff going on. They don't like the way he's acting. They don't like what he's preaching. They don't like the fact that, you know, who he's choosing to be as close, you know, as possible to him. And they don't like the fact that, that, you know, what he's saying is drawing people to him. This is his family. The latter part of verse 21 says, For they said he is beside himself. They thought, in other words, that he had done what? That he had lost his mind. They also thought the fact that he was, you know, angry and you know, furious and mad. They said, you know, and so we have to ask ourselves, did Jesus do something wrong that would constitute this attitude from his family and friends? Did Jesus do something wrong? Did he say something wrong? Did someone? No. Jesus is speaking the truth. And how many of you know that you could speak the truth in love to family and friends and those that hate you? And they're still going to hate you. Why? Because you spoke the truth.
One person has said this, it says, None are worse enemies of the gospel than they that should be enemies of it the least. You would think that your family and your friends would accept the truth that you're saying. But oftentimes they will fight against it the hardest. Why? Because they know who you are, they know who you've been, and they can't possibly you know, come to say, well, all of a sudden this person now is preaching the truth. They are automatically, you know, at times, you know, people sometimes, they like the truth when it benefits them, but if, it, if that truth causes them to have to change or even think about how life is going to be better for them, they're going to hate it. Sometimes people will accept it eventually, and they'll say, you know what, you are right. I'm not saying every single time that they're going to hate you. But there are times when you, when you go and you preach the gospel, you preach the truth, that they will go, you know what, Anthony's right. I do need to change. What are you speaking is true. Or they're going to come along there, and they're going to say, you know, Doug, I hear what you're saying, but I don't like it. And I don't like you. That's what they're going to do. So there's a very practical lesson in this first portion that we're going to see. Is sometimes our greatest disappointment can come from family and friends. They may say, you know what, you've lost your mind. We must, you know, we must make sure that we are right and then do it no matter who is around us. We must speak the truth in love. We must make sure, obviously, that we're right first, but we make sure that we speak that truth no matter who it is that we're talking to. No matter if it's mom or dad, or if it's the president of the United States, or whatever dignitary that there is, no matter what the consequence may be. Right? And so the bad advice, obviously, we saw in here is that they're all beside himself. They want to take him out because Jesus is preaching the truth. You know what? You need to follow what God's word says no matter what. And if God's word goes against what your pastor is preaching, who are you going to listen to? God's word. Thank you. For a moment there, I was kind of, I was kind of a little worried there. You know, I was like, no, don't listen to the pastor because the pastor's wrong then. But you need to listen to what God's word says. Make sure you're right. Make sure that it's got, and not the fact of like going, well, pastor, you're wrong and I'm right and I'm so much better than you. You don't even know what you're talking about. But you know what? You come to him, you say, you know what? Hey, you know what? I was reading this and I believe that you might be in error. I'm assuming after six and a half years that I have not been wrong all that much as far as what God's word says or, or I'm preaching what God's word should, uh, says, I should say, because I have yet to be approached. Now they're like, oh, today is the day. No. <laughs> Let's skip down a few verses down to verse, uh, verse uh, 31. We're going to read through uh, the end of the chapter. It says, then, came, uh, then came, there came then his brethren and his mother. So if he has brethren, what does that make him? Does that mean that he has siblings? There's that check mark against the Catholic Church. Then came, there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent, uh, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude uh, sat, about, uh, sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren uh, without, uh, without seek for thee. So in other words, they're, they're looking for him. And he answered them, uh, saying, Who is my mother and, or my brethren? He's not being disrespectful at this point, just so you know. He says, and he's not ever disrespectful. He says, and he looked around about uh, on them who sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my, uh, my brother and my sister and my mother. What is he saying there? He's saying, you know what? If you do the will of God, you are, you know, my brother, my sister. That's who he's saying. What's the one that? Uh, what's the one part of the family that he does not say? Father. You know why? I'm God the Father. Yeah. So the fact is, is that if we are believers in Jesus Christ. We've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved and everything else. The Bible says that we are brothers, sisters, mothers of the Lord. He says, these are the ones that are my family. 
These are, the, you know, this is my family. That's why I say that if you have a church family, you have much more than a blood family. Because there's times where your blood family, your kin, are going to what? They're going to come against you, right? Because they may not be saved. But your church family should be there to do what? To encourage you, to help you, to lift you up, right? Here's one of the, the common opinions in this day and age. Family comes first. Family always comes first. I've heard that growing up. Family come, always comes first. And I'm telling you, you're wrong. You say, well, my family is pretty important. Yes, I'm not saying that your family is not important. I'm saying that they're not first. This is a popular and politically correct opinion, but it's just an opinion. It's not the truth. The Bible is clear about family, and like I said, it is important. We, if we're married, are to do what? If you're married, you are to do what? You are to leave your parents. Correct? It is wrong for husbands or wives to prefer their birth family over their husband or wife. You say, what? wait, 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 am I just supposed to like just totally shun my parents? No, I'm not saying that. But you know what? When you have a discussion or you're trying to figure out how your family is going to be, it is between the husband and the wife. It is not for you to bring every single you know, a, a person around for their opinion. Especially if you, uh, and this goes especially if you're a believer. You are to go to the Word of God, see what the Word of God says, and I'm going to say, I'm going to go and do that. My, that's your family you know, that your, you know, the family that you have with your spouse takes precedent over what the opinion is of your mother and your father or your brother or sisters, right? Getting quieter now. You know, think about it. The other person left their family for you. They're trusting you on both sides of it. Just so you know, there's been many marriages that mommy and daddy have ruined. Do you know why? It's not because they're doing it on purpose. It's because their baby is telling them something. They're only getting one side of the story. My baby would never do wrong. And they're only here on one side. If, you're, if your parents, your, your family, I mean, yeah, if your parents can give you advice as far as staying neutral, which is a very hard thing to do because it's your child and your child in your eyes a lot of times can never do wrong. If they could stay neutral and say, well, you know what, this is what the Bible teaches and actually go from both sides, that's, some, that's something. But still, even at that, it's supposed to be something that you work out with your spouse. Husbands and wives, you are to work it out yourselves according to what the Word of God says. By, uh, by a, a child coming, and I say child, this is you know, like somebody that's 20 plus that's married, it will only put a strain on the marriage. You know why? Because if you say, well, my mom said, or my dad said, you want to start a fire right at that moment? I mean, that's going to you know, start a raging inferno. That's going to start, no matter on which side, it's going to put a strain on that relationship. So that way, even if, even if that situation is worked out, when you come over for the holidays, you're bringing the grandkids over, you're doing whatever, that the other one, whether it be husband or wife, is going to go and like, oh, it was you. I mean, it's going to be kind of on those same lines. It's going to be the fact that you're going, oh, so you got a, oh, you got a thought about what I'm going to do, huh? Oh, you got, you know, you got opinions on my marriage. Nobody ever does that, right, though? Nobody ever has that problem, correct? No? All right. We are to leave our children alone after marriage, parents. We are to leave our kids alone after marriage. If they come to us, one of the smarter things as a parent you can do is, I think you should go talk to your spouse. That is wisdom right there. That is wisdom right there. I know it's easier for you to air your dirty laundry because mommy and daddy are like, oh, don't come here, my baby. But one of the best things you can do is just say, you know what? You need to go talk to your spouse about this. 
I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you guys. But you need to go talk to them. That's the, that's the best advice that I can, that's the best advice that I can give you right there. Because you know why? Kids, when they get married, have to learn from their own mistakes. They have to learn from their own mistakes. And it's a scary thing for a kid to do that because, you know, you sit there and you always, you're always used to, you know, ages, you know, zero to 18. You know, if you get married at 18, zero to 18, when you fall and you scrape your knee, you're waiting for mom or dad to come over there and pick you up and put a Band-Aid on your knee. But when you go and you get married, it's no longer mom and dad that are going to come, you know, bandage up that knee. It's going to be your spouse. And you trusted them enough, right? And here's, the, here's one of probably the hardest parts. If you believe that you did a good job of raising your kids and teaching them the Bible, then let them put it into action. It's getting really quiet right about now. If we, if we truly believe that God's word won't return back void after we taught them for 18 years, we need to, I'm not saying it's easy. I've never said it's going to be easy because you're always going to want to go, oh, let me put that Band-Aid on. But what, you're, uh, what needs to happen is that you need to say, you know what? I, you know what? I taught you as much as I possibly could as the Word of God. And there's always that spot where you go, you know, I could have done better. I could have done whatever. But if you've, you know, you've made it your purpose to teach them the Word of God, you need to let them put it into practice and see if it works for themselves. Not because mom or dad said it. Not because grandma or grandpa said it. Not because my aunt or uncle said it, but because the word of God said it, and I believe it. Amen? One of the biggest things that we need to realize in this is the fact of the atonement. You say, where does the atonement come in this? The atonement means that it's an act of God reconciling or bringing us back to himself through the death on the cross. Because of the atonement, God reconciled that relationship. We need to, as parents, need to learn to reconcile with one another. As a family, we need to learn how to reconcile one another just as Christ has reconciled us to him. The Bible tells us in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, it says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right? Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, So shall my word... B, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall, what, not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the, in the thing whereto I send it. If we believe that God's word won't return void, and we train up our child in the way that they should go, what does it say? When they're older, they're not going to depart from it. That it's not going to come back void. There is an order and that's God's order. God claims our love first. God claims our loyalty first. That's why I said family is not number one. God is number one in our life. Our first love belongs to the Lord. It is the basis that we see of the Old Testament and in the entire Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, it says this, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, meaning your heart. And thou shalt teach them. Where are my teachers at? Thou shalt teach. And don't sit there and say, well, you know, Ashley. No. Thou shalt teach them. Does it give a, a preference of who's supposed to teach? So all your hands should have just raised up. Teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt, walk, uh, shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when uh, thou walkest by the way, and when thou uh, liest down, and, and when thou risest up. What is he saying? You're supposed to teach them what? When they're lying down, when they're waking up, as they're going about their day, as they're doing... Everything about your life is supposed to teach your children about the Lord. If you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, might, all those ways, it says, you know what? You're supposed to teach them. You're supposed to talk about them at the dinner table. You're supposed to talk about them, turn off the TV and talk. Because it's very easy. 
Very easy to go home. After a long day, you're tired. Come home, kids are screaming. Why? Turn on the TV. The Bible says that we're to do what? We are to teach them, you know, all throughout our day. I'm not saying that you can't watch TV. Just make sure you're watching something decent on TV, which is pretty hard to find nowadays. And when it says that word teach, that word teach literally means sharpen. So in other words, in verse 7, it means this, it says this, and thou shalt sharpen them diligently. If you sharpen a knife, you can't just go, and it's good. If you want it to be a really good blade, really good, you know, nice, sharp, that will cut through anything, sometimes you've got to spend hours sharpening that blade back and forth, making sure that thing is perfect. And thou shalt sharpen them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou, what, sittest in thine house? When you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You're supposed to teach them. You're supposed to sharpen them. Just like it says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, it says this, A sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the, counsel, uh, the countenance of a friend, of his friend. We are to sharpen one another, starting with our family. The biggest ministry that you will ever have is your family. I don't care if you're, you feel like your ministry is to go out and distribute food, if you're, you feel like it's to go door to door, if you feel like your ministry is to go to the nursing home, if you feel like all these different things. Your biggest ministry is your family. And you are supposed to have the Lord first, and then you are to minister to your family. That is why you see so many times where you have these you people will have like gigantic ministries and their families are in turmoil. Why? Because they put the ministry over their family. Sometimes parents, if parents are not saved, if they don't love the Lord, if they don't love God, they will hate the Lord for laying such a burden on them. You said, what? If you don't love the Lord, you will hate that burden of teaching your children what to do. If we love God and our kids, we will teach them and not have someone else teach them ungodly things. Let me say that again. If we love God and our kids, we will want to teach them and not have someone else teach them ungodly things. Do you think there's a reason why at public schools that you have to come back and you have to deprogram your children? Do you think it's by chance that all of a sudden like, there's this big, huge socialist agenda because they're teaching godly things at school? that they're teaching such wicked things, that they're teaching children ungodly, uh, perverted, wicked things in school, and you got to come back and try and teach them? Because you know what? As soon as that has been taught, you can't take it back. As soon as a child has seen something or heard something, you can't take it back. They can't take it back. They may want to. You may want to. But you can't take it back. May the countenance of us and our children reflect the Lord. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40 says this, Master, which is, the great, uh, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So in other words, all of our obedience and service must have an origin. It must be in love. It has to be. To everything that we do, to every single way, the good advice is to do what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to realize and to know that when you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a part of the family of God. This is your family. 1 John 3.18 uh, 3, says, My little children, let us, let us not love in word, 
neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know that truth needs to be spoken? Because I've heard oftentimes people say, well, you know what? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them that I love them. I'm not going to say anything to them. I could do a whole bunch of things for people. And the thing is that a person can, you know, in that moment, you know, or I could sit there and do all these things for them and they never know that I love them. You have to actually tell them. So what is that verse saying? It's saying, you know what, don't just go around saying I love you and then not following through with it. Not letting your actions follow through. And it's also saying, don't just sit there and do stuff for people and never tell them. Right? What I want us to realize with this bad advice and good advice, all those different things that are presented in this chapter, that sometimes, number one, sometimes our greatest disappointment can come through and come from our family and friends. Sometimes a family is going to disappoint you. Sometimes family are, are not going to, um, they are not going to agree with you on the decision that you've made. Sometimes family is not going to like the fact that you're raising your kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Sometimes that they're not going to like it, right? And our first, why? Because our first love and loyalty belongs to Jesus Christ. That is where our priorities are, to, uh, are supposed to be. Everything else trickles down from that. When we say family is first, or my job is first, or whatever is first, everything falls apart. The building block is wrong. But when we say, you know what, I'm going to put the Lord first, everything else falls into place. And remember, your family is one of uh, is the greatest ministry that you will have. I know that there's all this talk about, oh, I got to find God's will for my life. I got to find God's call in my life. Your call is to do what? Make sure your kids love the Lord. Teach them. Show them. See, that's a difficult thing. You know what? If you have a, you know, a child that's young, you grow with them. You learn with them. The child that you, know, that you have does not know more than you, even though that they tell you that they do. You can grow with them. If that, you, know, you say, you know what, that means, you know what, I'm not going to allow my kid to, you know, to learn you know, something that's ungodly. You know what, I'm going to take my child out of school or something like that so I can homeschool them. Your child learns with you. I can guarantee that everyone, if you have a, you know, a, a person that's in, you know, a child that's in first, second, or third grade, you know what one plus one is. You know, you know uh, your multiplication. I hope that you, open, you know your multiplication. I hope that you know, you know uh, the, the, uh, all these different words. They will grow with you. And lastly, may we sharpen each other, especially our kids. May we teach each other, especially our kids. That's why we have a family, is to teach one another. No one in here, the last time I checked, and I will say this, has arrived. No one in here has arrived. If you say, you know what, yes, I have arrived, that means that you're perfect, and that you're saying you're Jesus. Last time I checked, nobody in here is walking on water. But what I want you to realize in the, all this whole thing is that, you know what, whereas your family and your friends may let you down, or you, that may be your biggest discouragement and all this that you have going on. You have one, because if you're saved, you have one that sticks closer than a brother. You have one that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if your family all of a sudden disappoints you, your family says, I want nothing to do with you, your family says, oh, you have one that will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen? You have one that sticks closer than a brother. You have one that's going to be there no matter what. And so this morning, I want to pray over you. I want to pray for you. Because I know that, you know what, there's times where family is not going to like you. May, it, may the only reason why they don't like you is because that you, that you serve the Lord. Not because, you know, uh, you copped an attitude or something like that, or whatever, but you said, you know, I'm going to do what God wants, right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. 
I ask that, you're, uh, that this morning that we would realize that, yes, uh, the only one that we could truly trust, the only one that is truly loyal, the only one that, we could, uh, that is not going to leave us nor forsake us is you. Our family, our friends may disappoint us. They may think we're nuts, and they may think that we're, that we're goofy for going to church, that we, that we follow the Bible, that we read the Bible, that we pray. But, Lord, we, want, we realize and we know that you claim our first love and our, our, and our loyalty, Lord. Lord, may we teach that to our children and realize that, Lord, once we start our family, that is our family, and we need to read your word and follow what your word says. That we don't sit there and uh, run back and forth to mom and dad about, Mom, you know, my spouse did this. Mom, my spouse did that. Dad, my dad. You know, all these things. We say, you know what? No. We're going to go to the Word of God, and we're going to figure this out together. And we are going to teach our children to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.